Um, so we're going to hit on several um, different agronomic topics, subjects, um, and we're going to, I guess, want to set it up as these are, we did these where we want to go through them really fairly quickly. We're not going to give you a ton of detail on each one of these. Um, it's going to be focused primarily on ROI. So we've picked the ones that we see a, a really easy return on investment. So uh, if you got more questions about any one of these, just see us after any one of the consultants after, and we can drill into more detail if you want more, more information. So the topics we're going to focus on today are spatial and temporal stability with soil sampling, weed management, sulfur nutrition, late season nitrogen and starter fertilizers. So these will be the topics that JD and I will share. So I'm gonna kick it off and the, the thing that, that uh, I wanna, I guess, start with is we're kinda working through this chronologically. So step one is, is about how do we set up a good nutrient management plan? And, and really what we're talking about today is soil sampling. And for those of you that, that maybe aren't real familiar with Integrated Ag, we, we developed an automated soil sampling system about six years ago, which gave us the ability to take lots of soil samples very efficiently. So what that has led us to is, is the discussion on what is the right sampling density, how close together should these samples be, and then that leads us into the next topic, which is the temporal stability, and that is, is how often should we sample? And then lastly, we want to hit on, okay, we've we talked through all this, how do we make money off of this whole deal? It's not just about pulling soil samples, it's about return on investment. So, first thing we want to do, I guess we've already got it up here, is the Slido question, what's your preferred soil sampling density? So if you would, take a second. And uh, did you throw the other one up? It's all right. So what is your preferred soil sampling density? I'm just kind of curious what kind of, from a straw poll here in the audience, is that me or is that you? I suspected because a lot of you here are customers and a lot of you are probably using our high density half acre grid stuff, but uh, once again, uh, this is a, just a little bit of a straw poll. So it looks like a lot of you are using some fairly dense uh, sampling. Um, so really, really, really what soil sampling is all about, it's, uh, and I stole this slide from Josh Yoder, and um, it's, it's really a, a, about precision and accuracy. And I'm sure if any of you have uh, been through any kind of precision ag programs, they've talked about precision and accuracy. And it, soil sampling is just a great example of that because it's hard to achieve both those. Um, you know, in a perfect world, we would have, we would have this. We would be accurate and precise. The reality is, is this is about as good as we can do in soil sampling, is we can be pretty accurate at that point, but we can't be perfectly precise. What we want to stay away from is this over here, where we're not accurate, but maybe we're precise. In other words, we got the right measurement, but we don't have it in the right place, or worst case scenario, we're neither accurate nor precise. So why do I bring that up? Because I think it's really about setting reasonable expectations in what we're trying to do in when we talk about uh, fertility management and what we do with soil sampling. So this is an example of, uh, this is actually a field at uh, the Bex Research Farm there, uh, adjacent to the Farm Science Review there in London. And this side here, what I did is, is this is an organic matter map, and this map is based on all these data points. This is based on half acre grids. And one of the things that we looked at early on was kind of a simple, easy way to see whether um, we are really um, doing a good job of measuring what we're measuring. 
we felt pretty comfortable that we were precise, we were getting accurate measurements of organic matter, but were we accurate? Was, that, was this a dense enough data set here to model? And I don't know if you can see it well from there, but what I did is I lightened the, the, the layer up so these you can kind of see. This is a dark, this is a higher organic matter, this is kind of a Kokomo Crosby soil series, so it's very defined light and dark. And, and this is what we're looking for is, is when we do half acre grids, we see this modeling that just follows right along with those soil contours. Now this isn't a scientific approach, but what it tells us is, is, hey, if we know we've got dark soil and we're using algorithms to calculate, to estimate between points, and it's map matching up with that map pretty accurately, then we're probably, at least from a cursory standpoint, doing a pretty good job at that data density. This one over here is, is your traditional two and a half acre grids. That's a, a lot for a lot of folks. That's considered the best of the best. And the first thing that should stick out is look at all these data points versus these data points. And then look how far apart from each other we have to do estimates. So from the standpoint of calculating what the average organic matter for this field is, two and a half acre grids works pretty good. But when you want to get to that point where you're, you're accurate and you want to be able to model like this, what you start to see is, is there's just no way to come up with the right algorithm to do those estimations between points. This has been a problem over and over again. This is what led us to the point that we wanted to figure out a better way. The better way was to take more data points. That's really the only answer. Then it becomes how do we do it? Then it becomes how do we do it economically? So this is the same field, same set of soil test data. And this is, I picked the soil, or the soil pH. Um, and what we did here is once again, we're using the same kind of, um, the same data points, using um, algorithms to, to, in turbulations to estimate between points. And the thing that's neat about this field, once again, it's just common sense, good old fashioned agronomy is, is this is a creek right here. Deer Creek runs along here. And those of you that, that farm along creeks, a lot of times those type of soils have high pHs. There's a lot of gravel outlay underneath and the subsoil straight. Typically the subsoils are high pH. And typically we see high pHs along those areas. And this is the case here. It's not, not unexpected, but it's the same thing that happens. If you look at this is where those dark soils were, basically the old floodplain uh, swampy areas long time ago, and that's where you would expect to see high pHs. It makes sense. And that's where we're mapping and modeling. We're going, it makes sense. That's where we would expect to see it. And we get this blurry picture over here by taking 21 samples, but we, we are losing our ability to be very accurate at what we want to do, particularly if we're going to take a map like this or a map like this and say, let's apply line where it needs to be applied. Well, if, if we're not careful, we could end up either, and this is typically what happens, is we tend to over-apply where we really need to. The areas, because there's less data points, it tends to we either miss them, and we don't apply any line at all, or we apply areas that are, that are much larger than need to really be applied. So this is really the premise behind getting more data points and why we talk to you guys all the time about this is why we have to have high definition, half acre grids, something like that. So I always like to show this because this is really just an R squared statistical value. And what we did is, is this is this field and, and we've done this on many, many fields. And basically the numbers seem to always come back about the same. And that is, is so what we did here to back up just a second is we compared the half acre, the one acre and the two and a half acres to quarter acre grids. And what quarter acre grids means is every 100 feet we took a soil sample. And we compared that then and said, okay, that's the very best. How does that compare to half acres? And then we looked at those R squared values. And in, in soil fertility, um, it's very, very difficult to see R squared values really above 0.5 in a lot of cases. And what we find over and over again is, is that we're able, with that high density data, we're able to model fairly accurately. And, and it's not perfect. 
In, in some environments, you're going to look and say, well, I want an R squared value of 0.9 or 0.95, and, and that's wonderful. But this is also an example of how much variability we're dealing with in soil sampling and why it's so important that we capture as much information as possible. So another question that comes up quite a bit is about, so we're using this automated sampling system and it's very unique. It's taking a furrow slice versus taking core samples. Those of you, once again, that aren't familiar with us, uh, typical soil sampling, you put a, a probe in the ground, about six to eight inches, and you collect it through a core. Our system, it's a knife, and it fills the cavity. So it's really different. And the question needs to be asked, and we, we did this work way back when, in 2010, when we started to develop this, can we do a good job, does it work right? And the answer was yes, but we just came back this last year, we said, you know what, there's a whole bunch of people that, that are asking this question and we should be able to, to revalidate again what happens. And, and we're back to comparing, in this case, what we did is, is we ran quarter acre grids, pretty sure of that, yes. And so we sampled the field every 100 feet and then we turned around and we had our guys go back in with the hand probe and they probed in that same spot every 100 feet. So we could compare hand cores versus the furrow slice. And these are the results of what you see. And once again, um, from a soil fertility standpoint, that's really, really good. And it's the kind of thing you would expect. Things like CEC, uh, the calcium and mags, those are things that are pretty reliable to read on. And we're seeing some really high R squared values. Very, very accurate. Potassium is one that uh, is one that's always a challenge for us, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And, and that's about what we see. So the, the point being is, 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 does it work? Does the auto sampler work as compared to hand samples? Absolutely. It's every bit as good. It's, uh, it's, in the real world, it's better because we don't have a human pushing a probe into the ground repeatedly and we're relying on that human to do it the exact same way every time. We're letting a machine do it because the machine doesn't care, doesn't get tired, doesn't take breaks and does a much better job. It's just reality. So that's the spatial talk on this, this here and, and, and the answer very simply is, is yes. In order to have spatial integrity we need lots of data points. That's the message. So what about the temporal side of things? What about sampling over time? And we really, up until about a year ago, um, we couldn't tackle this problem because we could never understand the spatial side of it. We never were able to get to the place that we had consistent enough data coming back in over and over again that we could go any further. And so what this talk is really about here is, is so this is a field that was soil sampled on half acre grids in 2012 and then we came back in this last year I believe it was in 2017 I'm not sure I think that's yeah that's it and we resampled it again and this is what we would like to see is yes we still have some these these areas here are the lowest and we're seeing basically the same places but the low areas are getting smaller so from a soil fertility standpoint, from an accuracy standpoint, this is pretty good. And this was done over a, a, basically a five year period, feel pretty good about it. The problem though is, is that, oops, I guess we got a Slido question. So did, you wanna throw that one up there? Or? Yeah, um, there was a previous question too. So that was going back to your example, I think it was your um, comparing it to the two maps. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just going to keep on rolling and people can answer, ask them, answer the question as they have time. So I'm back on the temporal stability piece. And, and this, so what we've done is, is, is about, uh, it kind of happened by accident. We took this particular field and we soil sampled this field at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. And we did that just to kind of build a database because we could, really. It's easy for us to pull samples, so that we said, let's just sample this thing and see what happens. And, and this is what you would expect to see, is that while the map isn't perfect, um, it's pretty close. This was done on one acres, this was done on half acres. You kind of see that we have a little more granularity on this one, but basically the map is the same. 
So we're going, good, this is what we would expect. But then we get this, and this does happen too. And here we've got one acre grids in the fall of 15. We turn around and we do one acre grids in the fall of 16. And we see a 15% decrease in the potassium values in this field. And this happens. It doesn't happen on every field, but as agronomists, we'll see this. Um, I don't know what the percentage would be, but I'm going to say probably 15, 10% of the time we'll get fields that will go, how can that be? We've, uh, we were applying a buildup potassium value here, and we come back and we soil sample it, and our numbers are going down. Somebody's lying to me. So, it, but it hasn't been until we got to the place that we were taking lots of soil samples that we could get to this place here and say, why is that? Why, what's the problem? And I'm going to tell you right now, on this part of the presentation, the answer isn't going to be some silver bullet that Dave Scheider's got it all figured out and this is what we're going to do and this problem solved. It's more about a combination of a lot of things that we have to do to manage around this. So what causes it? Well, the first thing is, is we still come back to, you're talking about soils that have tremendous amounts of variability in them. There's, there's plenty of research out there that shows that if you soil sample every foot, I mean literally every foot, you can get some pretty dramatic differences from one foot to the next. That's inherent to what we see in soil sampling. Now that variability can also be meshed together, which is what we do, so we can make corrective applications. But as we go across the field, no matter what the resolution is, we're going to have some inherent variability just from where the soil sample is taken. Corrective applications. This is a dynamic system we have. All of us are farming these acres and we're doing different things. We're applying lime, we're applying fertilizers, we're growing crops. All those things are constantly changing. So a soil sample is a snapshot in time. It's what's going on that day. And that day is, is, is relative to all those other things that you've been doing. So it's hard to sort all that out all the time. There's biological activity in the soil. We, we're starting to talk more about that soil health. And part of that soil health piece is also about how that impacts the availability of nutrients. So this, this nutrient cycling thing we're talking about is, is in constant motion. And, and there's lots of things like weather that affect that, affect that biological activity, affect the chemistry that's going on in the soil, which affects how much nutrient is available at any one given time. There's the nutrient cycling piece. You know, we're, today we raise, we raise enough um, green matter, a corn crop. You know, we're building a factory that has the potential to raise 300 plus bushel corn. Now we very seldom achieve that, but in a lot of times as we go through that rapid growth phase with corn and with soybeans the same way, we're building a huge factory. And that factory is pulling a tremendous amount of nutrient up and into the system. That's naturally going to potentially lower that, the sponge, the soil, as it grows. And then as the, the, we're only harvesting the grain in most cases, so it recycles itself and goes back in. Well, that has some effect on what our soil test values are. And the last piece is, is lab testing procedures. The lab testing procedures, if you, if you get a chance, take a tour of the lab. But what the lab is really about is it's trying to measure the plant available nutrient. There's lots of potassium in the soil. There's lots of phosphorus in the soil. And what we're, we're not worried about all of it. We're only worried about that portion that is plant available. And the procedures and the systems that we use in the lab are critical to, to consistently measure it the same way. How we take those samples, it's critical that we take them the same way. So, and, and that provides some variability into the system. So what's most effective? Uh, potassium, no doubt about it. Uh, this is the one that we're gonna see jump around more than anything else. Certain high clay content soils, I throw Miami soils, those light, light soils that we have in Logan County and, and uh, Union County, the, the Puamos, the Blouts, real high clay content soils, those uh, through that drying and wetting cycle, those layers of clay fracture 
and that releases or, or binds up potassium fairly easily. So those provide more of a struggle. Well, what we've seen through the years, all the years of soil sampling that we've done is if we want to see potassium values kind of shake up, it's usually those very dry soils that we have late in the summer. Um, and I don't exactly know why, and it's so random that we can, we can pull a soil sample in a field today and we'll see, whoa, where did those numbers come from? But the next field right beside it, the same type of soils, we won't have any problems at all. So it's, it's very elusive. It's not as simple as when I put this up there, I'm going, oh, these guys are all going to say, well, don't sample then. Well, we don't know when then is until we've sampled. And even then, we don't know what then is. pH is another one. Somewhat very much the same thing. It's typically when we sample in the fall, uh, right after harvest, and it's been very dry. Um, that's when we'll see, and it's usually lower pHs. We'll go, oh, wait a second. We didn't, why now are we needing to apply all this line? And once again, it's very random. It's not every field, it's not every field that's sampled during that time frame. It's probably 10 or 15% of the fields. And there, we, we haven't been able to tie it to anything specific yet. Phosphorus sometimes can be a problem, but typically it, it really ties back to either something like a heavy manure application or some sort of, of problem we've had spatially where we just took it in a different spot and we got a different number. Phosphorus usually is, is the stablest of these three, and, but it, it can be a problem at times. Unfortunately, these three are the big three that when we do soil fertility, these are the ones that we're trying to manage the most, the most expensive. So it, I wish I could say it was something that we never really dealt with, but it isn't. So how do we minimize it? And this probably sounds like a sales pitch, but it's the truth. The first is, is you have to have high density sampling. You have to have lots of data points. If we rely less on one specific data point, we're going to be much more likely to be much more accurate about what we're doing. There's just no way around it. That's what has to happen. We need to talk about shorter sampling intervals. The more you lower your density, the more you need to increase your sampling cycle. If you're a zone sampling guy, then you should be sampling every year. And we'll talk more about this. It's just the way it is. We do high density sampling. We can stretch that cycle out a little bit, um, but if stretching it out a little bit is four years. We need to be looking at this thing in four year increments. What I like is, is if we do half acre grids in a four year cycle, that usually gives us two fertilizer to four fertilizer cycles and two lime cycles. So we can stay caught up with all those things that we're doing and it doesn't kill us. We're not always chasing our tail going, well, we lined last year, we sampled this year, what do we do? Because the samples this year are still reflective of what we did last year. So it's, it's a place where I think the, the high density helps us out. Something we're encouraging our guys to do, and we're getting some traction on this now, is, is that the best time to soil sample is in crop in the spring. After you're done planting, we come in and we soil sample between the corn rows or in your soybeans. We won't do any damage. That soil is settled. There's, there's generally plenty of moisture there and we get our most consistent results then. It's not that it has to be done then, but a lot of you don't think of it at that time as being a good time to do it. It's really one of the best times to do it. Quality lab with quality controls. Um, you'll see it in our lab. About every 30th sample is a quality control check. And we do this over and over again with each procedure that we do. If we don't like something we see, we'll rerun it back through the lab again. Our ability to have a lab gives us a lot of checks and balances. It allows us to manage and control what's going on. We just don't send the samples in, get results back, and then ask questions. It's really been a huge asset for us to improve the quality that we get out of a lab. Samples need to be taken exactly the same way. Um, we need to eliminate as much human error as possible. Once again, you probably say, Dave, you're just, you're just pitching the auto sampler, and I am. But there's a reason. And the reason is, is that when the ground gets hard or the ground gets soft, and the guy on that probe is going to react to that one way or the other. He's either going to take too deep of probes, he's not going to take enough probes, he's going to take too shallow probes. 
when you put that on a machine and it's timed that every 150 feet it's going down in the ground seven inches, it's going down in the ground seven inches. The man on that machine is there to make sure it all works right and that's it. So I'm, I'm coming back to this slide and the, the idea behind this is, 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 is very simply, this is where we need to live. And it's really about cost. When it's all said and done, it's how many samples can I take and how much is it going to cost me? Because I need to take as many as I can. And this is why I put this in here. Is, is here we are. If, if you're drinking the Kool-Aid I've been preaching, if you're going to do zone sampling, you need to do it every year. If you're going to do uh, two to three acre grids, you need to do it every other year. If you're going to do... Um, three, excuse me, one acre grids, you probably should be at about every three years. And if you're going to do the quarter or half acre grids, you're in every four years. What does that do? The message is, is that it's basically the same cost. My reason for pushing you here is, is that I'm getting a lot more data for just a little bit more money. And, and it, it, it really sets us up to do the best we can to achieve that, that accuracy. Evan showed this slide earlier, and uh, I want us to show it again. This is a group of farmers that we work with very closely, and actually they own their own lime spreader, and so we know exactly what's going on. And so in 2012, this is really when a lot of half-acre grids got started with these guys. They spent almost $400,000 in lime that year. But ever since then, we've seen it go down, and now we're starting to plateau. The question always is asked, does precision ag pay? I get that a lot. It's a hard answer to give, but this is the best answer I can give is, is we're at a place now where we've taken those, those acres and mainly got it down to where it's $300,000 less they're spending today than they were five years ago. And that's getting applied directly to each one of those guys' bottom line. They don't have pH problems anymore. The pH, the, the challenge we've got with this at this point is, is we are creating these small islands, islands of a quarter acre, half acre, and we don't know how to spread them because they're so isolated, it just is almost impossible to spread those. With that, and I believe I went long, so I apologize. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna need this remote. Um, so I'm gonna talk about weed control and I've got some thoughts on corn herbicides and soybean herbicides, and you may agree or disagree, but um, we'll go through them and we'll see what you think. So I, I put this picture up here. This is where we all want to be at the end of the season. So this is a cornfield in the fall, and there are no weeds uh, in sight, right? I think we can all agree that that is the preferred outcome at the end of the year for a herbicide program. So I'm just curious, um, Slido should be coming up here, as to what type of herbicide programs you guys are running, whether it's a one pass, pre, or early post, or if it's a two pass, uh, pre and post approach. Um, I'll kind of gauge the responses and that'll tell me uh, if I should talk highly of one or the other. Okay, so it looks like a lot of people are doing a one-pass program, which is fine. A one-pass will work, uh, but we have to do it in the correct way. Um, so I've really simplified corn herbicide programs here with this management triangle, and we're allowed to choose two of these three options. Whichever two you choose, you don't get the third one. So if you want a one-pass that's going to be effective and you have a weed-free field at the end of the season, it's probably not going to be a low-cost program. If you want an effective program that is low-cost, you're probably not, you're probably going to give up the convenience of that one-pass program and have to make two applications. Um, and then finally, if you want to go with a cheap one-pass applied before planting, uh, you may end up with weeds at harvest. And that may be okay if you don't have high weed pressure, uh, just something to be aware of. 
And this is all circling around these problem weeds we're going to have in 2019 in corn, um, water hemp and Palmer amaranth, which I'm going to talk about more extensively in the soybean portion, uh, giant ragweed, which is always out there in corn or soybeans generally, uh, and then late season grasses, which aren't a huge problem, but if we can control them, why not? Uh, so a one-pass program can work, but there are some things you need to do, and that's apply them as late in the season as possible. So push that back from planting uh, towards an early post timing. Because when you plant, you shouldn't have any weeds anyway, right? Uh, if you're conventional till, it's pretty easy to achieve that. Uh, but if you're no-till, that can be a little more challenging. You maybe need to do a fall burndown program if possible, which fall of 18 was not great for that. Uh, but we need to start clean to have an effective one pass. And when you spray, that residual product has a lifetime of control in the, you know, of weeds. So if we can push it back a little later, we can extend that period of control later into the season. Hopefully we can get corn canopy and, and uh, we won't have any weeds. So um, how do we run an effective two-pass program in corn? You need a good pre-program, uh, a burn down, and then, you know, some, any of these will work fine. Just atrazine and acetochlor or metolachlor, sure start. There's a dozen different products and generic alternatives that'll fulfill that need. Um, and then post, we need to be following it up with a couple of these options, atrazine or glyphosate or Liberty plus um, generic Callisto or Dicamba. I'm on a huge generic Callisto kick just because it's at a really good price point for 2019. Um, and here's what those programs look like. So an effective two pass, we're doing that pre post approach. It's gonna be in that 22 to $25 range. Uh, whereas an effective one pass, it's gonna cost a little more, but you have the convenience of, you know, not having to go out there later in the season where you might get rained out or you don't have time to make that second application. Um, so kind of to wrap up my thoughts on corn herbicides for 19, weed pressure, especially from water hemp, is going to require more intensive management. Water hemp is here. If you drove around last fall uh, in August or September, you could see patches of water hemp all around the countryside, and it's, it's gonna blow up in 19 or 20. Um, and a one-pass program can work, uh, but that convenience of only making one application comes with a cost uh, in dollars. And if you, you, you know, a one-pass program would be great too if you can target low pressure fields, fields you don't have a lot of giant ragweed or water hemp, palmer amaranth in. Um, if you target those low pressure fields with the one pass, then you can focus on your problem child fields with that two pass program and have weed free fields at harvest. Uh, so soybeans, you know, we had some big issues in 2019. The first one is that we didn't get a fall to burn down applied in 2018. A lot of people didn't finish harvest until December, so at that time of year, there's not really much time to go out and spray for weeds. Um, and the other issue is uh, water hemp and Palmer amaranth. It's gonna blow up this year. I hope I can tell you I was wrong later in the summer, but uh, just from what we've seen driving around last year, it's gonna be a major problem. Um, in the slide of full, I'm just curious what traits everybody's gonna be planting this year. Um, I've heard all of these mentioned from different growers that we work with. Um, and we can leave this up, I'll just kind of take note of it. So fall burn down. If you're doing no-till soybeans, you need a fall burn down. It's the only way to control mare's tail uh, from surviving over the winter. And turbo till, while great for stock management and creating a seed bed in the spring, does, I, don't, I don't count it as tillage. Uh, and a fall burn down is cheap. You're going to spend five bucks an acre on either of these programs. Uh, and if we have to use dicamba in the spring, that's going to cost eight to ten dollars per acre, depending on what product you use. Um, so how do we control overwintered mare's tail because we didn't apply a fall burn down? Um, these are 
pretty much the options we have from uh, best or from worst to first, I guess. Uh, 2,4-D glyphosate is not real effective at controlling an overwintered mare's tail. They're too big. Uh, they've got a great root system established. Uh, Sharpen by itself, not great on overwintered mare's tail. So we should really be throwing in dicamba. Uh, Liberty. Anybody use Liberty? Show of hands. I don't have a slide pole for this. Nobody? Okay. Well, Liberty likes hot and sunny weather to be effective. And, you know, when we're planting, when we're spraying our burn down in April or early May, we don't have a lot of hot and sunny days to get that Liberty applied. Um, Gramoxone and 2,4-D. Gramoxone is probably underused, but it can be a little pricey. So you're going to want to check your price point on that. Um, and dicamba works really well on overwintered mare's tail as a part of, you know, a comprehensive burn down program. Uh, with Roundup and all of your residual products. Okay, we're cruising. Water hemp and Palmer, you're not going to like it. I guarantee it. Um, the bad on water hemp and Palmer, it has a long emergence window, so it's going to, if it can get sunlight to the soil, it's going to emerge. Um, half a million to a million seeds per plant is what we're dealing with, and it moves in water. This year, as you drove around, anywhere a ditch or a creek got out, there was water hemp there, which can cause a lot of issues for farmers. <coughs> the good, if you call it that, it's got a short seed life. So if, if you can control it for four years, you're doing really good in reducing that seed bank. Um, but so, you know, what's 1% of a million seeds though, right? So that's the challenge we have with water hemp. Um, and we all need to become familiar with this phrase, layered residuals. You're going to hear it a lot, um, and I'll get into what that means, uh, but it's going to add six to twelve dollars per acre to your herbicide program. Uh, any more positives when in relation to water hemp and palmer? I have cereal grains up there. You know, if you have a good wheat stand or barley, that will prevent it from emerging, uh, but when you harvest that wheat or barley, it's going to come on up out of the ground. So at that point, you know, if we can plant some Liberty Link double crop soybeans, Liberty is decent on water hemp. Um, I put Liberty because I'm not sure how many folks want to be spraying dicamba in the month of July, as hot as it is. So that's just kind of where I'm coming from there. Uh, and it's easier to control in corn because we have more herbicides to control water hemp. Uh, but water hemp has resistance issues in corn too. So we have biotypes that are resistant to atrazine and mesotrione, which is your generic Callisto product. Um, and in Ohio, we have what's in this square, as far as I know, we have Flexstar, Cobra resistance, and Roundup, or glyphosate resistance in water hemp. And the PPO resistance is huge because if your uh, population of water hemp in your field that you're growing, purposefully or not, is not PPO resistant. We can use Flexstar or Cobra as a tool for control. Uh, but if it is, you're just going to waste money by throwing those products out there. Um, University of Illinois has a great lab for testing PPO resistance in water hemp. Uh, you just mail them plant tissue samples and they'll email you back some results. So the plan for water hemp and Palmer, you know, we need to run that normal residual program pre. Then at V3, V5, we need to come in with our first post application with that additional layered residual product. And that's a lot earlier than most folks are used to uh, posting soybeans. A lot of folks like to wait till canopy, uh, but that's no longer an option. And then everybody should be, when you're doing your crop budgets, budget in that second post when weeds are four to five inches tall. Uh, you won't have to make that application everywhere, but it's better to have it in the budget than not. So to break it down, number one, residual program, heavy residual products, pre, as close to planting as possible. So if you have dicamba soybeans, put those out there, you know, right before you plant. If you don't have dicamba soybeans and you're doing 2,4-D, you're putting that residual product out there a week early. Right, so that's a week of residual you're losing that could have been pushed later into the growing season. Uh, that second, that first post with at V3, V5 with the additional layered residual products, those are your options. 
Uh, Matola Floor is probably the cheapest if you can find some good generic sources. Um, and then second post as needed, you know, Scout. Um, we'll talk about some scouting options later today. Um, so here's a budget. Liberty soybeans, I don't think these prices are too out of line. You can let me know later if you think they are, but we're going to be spending 50 to 55 bucks an acre in these programs when you budget in that second post um, to get good control of water, hemp, and polymer. Uh, dicamba soybeans, you're right in there again. Um, 50, 55 bucks an acre. And I should put PPO, I should have put Flexstar on the previous slide too, but you know, if your population is not PPO resistant, Flexstar and Cobra can be tools that you can use to control water hemp. So let's talk about, we're talking about ROI. Dave and I are talking about return on investment a lot during this talk. So water hemp emerging at V5, you can see a 10% yield reduction at harvest. So 10% on 60 bushel beans is six bushels, 50 to $60 you could be losing. Um, your additional residual products are only six to $12. So you know, that'd be a net return. If you have season long water hemp, you don't get that residual out there pre, um, and you're not controlling them, you can see a 44% yield reduction. Um, and if you have to mow a field to prevent weed seed production, you know, that's not great on your bottom line either. And in really infested fields, that's been the recommendation that I've had to make, and I know OSU Weed Science has had to make that recommendation as well. Um, because if it goes to seed, it's all over for that year and the next year and the next year. Um, so soybean thoughts, water hemp is really going to change how we look at weed control in Ohio. Um, $50 per acre programs are here. Um, I don't like it, but we're going to have to get used to it. Uh, you know, four or five years ago, maybe longer, in all the farm magazines, we would read rumblings from the south, the southern delta states, that we're spending 50 bucks an acre on soybean herbicide programs. Well, now it's unfortunately made its way up here. Um, and the final kind of disclaimer that I feel like I need to make, make sure you're label compliant when you're applying dicamba. So you don't drift on your neighbors. Um, that's a bad time for everybody involved. Okay, and I think, yeah, that's all I have. Dave's gonna come up and talk about sulfur. Thank you, JD. Sulfur. Why are we talking about sulfur? Well, let's take a slide of question. Do you apply sulfur to your corn, your small grains, or soybeans? You could throw that one up there, if you don't mind. See what we come up with here. I'm curious as to how much sulfur is being used as a, as a whole. There's a lot of sulfur going on corn, it looks like. That's excellent. I'm surprised that the mountain's going on soybeans. So You've probably seen some of these slides before, but I think it's an easy take-home message. Is from a sulfur perspective, um, we have done a lot over the last 20 years to clean sulfur out of the air. Scrubbing out of primarily at power plants are, are scrubbing a lot of sulfur out. And we're in coal country, so there's a lot of high sulfur coal that's burnt, particularly down along the Ohio River. And, and that's been really good for us farmers because we've been getting a lot of free sulfur through this acid rain. Here's another way to look at it, more of a visual perspective. But say, look from 2001, we were, we were pushing um, in excess of 18 pounds of sulfur per year up into the atmosphere back down onto the ground. Whereas in 2015, that's been cleaned up a bunch. So we just aren't seeing as much sulfur from an atmospheric standpoint as what we used to. And that really is the take home message here is, is that we're no longer getting any freebies. So we need to look at this a little differently than what we have in the past. 
Uh, probably in the last five to seven years is when I really noticed it. Seeing it uh, kind of started with, why is this corn? It's been side dressed, but it's not greening up like it normally does. And it'd be kind of patchy and blotchy looking. And then when you get closer to it, you'd see these these yellow streaks, the intervenal chlorosis, and you go, oh, okay. And it's sulfur. And today we see it a lot, um, particularly early in the season when it's cool. If we have wet conditions, we'll see some sulfur deficiencies in, in corn. But we're seeing it other places too. This is a, a, a drone shot. I believe it's a drone shot, J.D., yeah. of an alfalfa field. And you can see the, the green streak here where they went diagonally across the field and applied 100 pounds of AMS, yeah. roughly. And, and alfalfa is a legume. And you wouldn't think you'd see it. But alfalfa also uses a fair amount of sulfur. So tremendous response for this. And, and up until a few years ago, we never even thought about uh, sulfur and alfalfa being a critical nutrient that, that uh, and we just see it all the time now. Soybeans, I don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but this streak right here, they applied 100 pounds of AMS. This streak here, they didn't. This streak here, they did. And then uh, this streak here, they didn't, and then the rest of the field. And to, to be able, and this was right as the soybeans were starting to senesce, so it's kind of at that time of year, you might see it more so than maybe earlier on, but maybe not. We had a lot of rain last year too, but we were seeing sulfur deficiencies in soybeans, um, which is really unusual that we haven't seen a lot of in the past. So I wanted to try and pull some research together for you and, and try and, uh, once again, our, our message today is to try and tie this all back to ROIs. And, and so this is some stuff coming out of uh, Iowa all the way back in 2009. And they did a really nice job. It's, uh, it's through IPNI. Um, a good set of research, and they were showing on average about a five bushel yield increase by applying sulfur. Uh, lots of different scenarios, um, pretty convincing, really. So we did some work in 2017. Once again, I, I'll say it again, we saw we've been seeing a lot of sulfur deficiencies, um, um, particularly where we, we uh, tr struggle with the practical way to do this is guys that use anhydrous ammonia because it's not an easy way for them. Uh, they're using anhydrous and they don't use starter fertilizer. We have to figure out a way to get sulfur on that crop and it's not easy to do. In this particular case, we did strips, set it up so it was just a simple strip trial where we, we applied sulfur, AMS, and where we didn't. Uh, I think it was around 80 pounds, uh, 90 pounds per acre is what we did. Um, what we saw was, is, is where we did not apply sulfur, it was 228. And where we did apply sulfur, it was 235, about a seven and a half bushel yield advantage on lots of strips. And you could see it in the field, you could see it in the crop, it really, really showed up. So we've talked a little bit about our ELBs, enhanced learning blocks. This is a study we did in conjunction with Tigersol. Tigersol is an elemental sulfur product, and they're looking at uh, ways and places to place it in the state of Ohio. So we, we did a, a, a research project in conjunction with them. And this is once again one of these that we, we can pull some statistical data out of this because we do replications. This is just a, a sample of what the block is and this is a sample of one field. We did four different locations where the sulfur was applied and where it wasn't applied. I think it was also applied at two different rates if I remember right. So this is kind of a summary of those results. A little bit of the same thing again. We're seeing about a seven bushel yield response from, from the sulfur application as an elemental application, which just as a quick refresher, sulfur in its elemental form has to be broken down and converted to a sulfate before the plant can take it up. And this was applied um, in the crop. Um, I don't remember exactly the growth stage, but I'm gonna guess it was V5, V6, something like that when it was applied. And we still ended up seeing some response to that, which is somewhat surprising. I will also tell you, because we can do the statistical work on this, while it, it, it consistently responded at about seven bushels, there's still enough noise in the data. We're gonna rerun the trial again this year that we can't statistically say that, that this is an absolute no-brainer to do it this way. Um, and then we broke it down to using, breaking it down into to high CPUs, which would be very high productive soils, and then low CPUs, 
low producing. We really saw about the same thing. It was about a seven bushel difference either way. So it's another form of sulfur, kind of seeing the same results. So this is some research. They haven't published this yet. This is out of Purdue. And uh, once again, they're kind of, they've, they've got their first set of data this year. And I, I highlighted uh, basically the summary information in that the, in six of 11 trials, they saw significant yield increases from four to 22 bushels with an average of 14 bushels. And they too are gonna redo their test study again next year and uh, put a couple years on top of it. But all indications are it's, it's matching up with what we're seeing in the field here too. So let's throw some costs at this. Uh, our, our goal today is to always bring things back to an ROI. So there's several products you can use. Um, ammonium thiosulfate is one that's very popular. It gets mixed in with 28% or 10340 as a starter a lot. It's a nice quality product. To, to get 17 pounds um, of sulfur, you're gonna need uh, to apply this much ammonium thiosulfate to do it. It's gonna cost you about $6 per acre. Ammonium sulfate is a dry product um, and it's a little cheaper. Um, you're ending up with the same thing, 17 pounds. We've got a lot of guys using, there's a byproduct out there. This, it's actually, in the, it's used to make insulin that has a, it's a nitrogen sulfur product that gets blended with 28% or 32% and you end up with a 28.01.6 and you can store it over the winter. A lot of guys are using this. It's a very economical program, about 260 per acre uh, to do it. And then the Tiger Saw is, uh, is a little bit more expensive, but it has a nice fit if you're wanting to put it in with your dry fertilizer, do a fall application, you know, combine trips. That's where it seems to, to shine. And then the last one is gypsum. Uh, gypsum, some of you guys may be using gypsum as a soil amendment to, to build soil till. Gypsum has 19%, it's a 19% sulfur product, it contains a lot of sulfur. A lot of times, strictly for the sulfur side of it, it doesn't make a lot of sense because, I believe I did my math, it's like 80 or 90 pounds, I think it's 90 pounds of gypsum, which is, I don't know how you would apply 90 pounds of gypsum, it's kind of, if you're not familiar with it, it's like applying lime. Or you apply a higher rate for the soil amendment side, you're gonna apply something like a ton, maybe a ton and a half, which gives you loads of sulfur, but from an economic standpoint, it kind of blows you out of the water if you're just strictly doing it for the sulfur source. So tying that all back together, what have we got? Well, you can, you can, I think you can realistically look at this from a four to 20 bushel yield response about 65% of the time. Sulfur is very much like nitrogen. When we do nitrogen studies, we do rate, rate studies with nitrogen, um, it's not a, a straight linear curve where more nitrogen equals more yield. You're gonna get this up and down. And it's the same way with sulfur. But I come back to when you're getting, you know 65% of the time, you're gonna easily pay back that, that 250 to $5. You only need a bushel and a half to make that work. Um, to me, this seems like a no-brainer. If you're not using sulfur and corn, you should be using sulfur and corn. If you're not using sulfur and wheat, you should be using sulfur and wheat. If you're not using sulfur and alfalfa, we don't have any real strong data on that, but based on what we're seeing, I think we should all be looking at some sort of sulfur application in, in, in crop for alfalfa. Soybeans, a little bit different story, um, don't know. We're are hoping and planning on setting up some of these ELBs on soybeans this year where we can do some enhanced learning blocks and get some good statistical data. I think soybeans are gonna be a little more squirrely because they fix her in nitrogen and, and there's a whole lot of stuff going on. But um, observationally, I, we're, we're seeing 10 years ago, it would, have, it would have been no, don't do it. Today, I think we need to look at it. So we're gonna try and, and probably will be talking to some of you guys about maybe cooperating with us on some of those ELBs for soybeans. So that's all I've got. JD, back to you. All right, so my last topic here is late season nitrogen. Um, and I guess we can bring that Slido up. It's a real generic question. Do you, have you, like, what is the question? Yeah, have you applied late season nitrogen up on Slido there? 
Um, but I wanted to start with this nitrogen management picture, or the nitrogen cycle, I should say, just so that we can all kind of have it in our minds as we go through this and understand that there are a lot of different factors that affect if we have nitrogen later in the season. Uh, rainfall and weather are kind of at the top of the list. And we have some interesting case studies um, about that here later in this presentation. So these are pretty good numbers, about half, almost half and half around, up and down, um, have applied late season nitrogen and haven't. So the questions I'm gonna hopefully address are, do we need late season nitrogen? When does late season nitrogen pay? And um, what are the options for late season nitrogen? I think they're in that order, but we'll see. Um, so do we need late season nitrogen? Um, maybe, you know, how do we know if we have enough or not? Um, there's some different tools we can use to determine how much nitrogen we have in the soil. Um, the ones I'm going to address are nitrogen modeling algorithms. They're becoming more popular. Um, soil nitrate testing, corn stalk nitrate testing, CSNT, um, and finally aerial imagery. Um, so these nitrogen algorithms, the, um, all these tools are, you've probably heard of them, or all three of them, in Circa, Adapt In, Climate Corporation, um, they all have nitrogen modeling algorithms that use the weather and some sort of soil data to help us figure out, okay, you, you enter how much nitrogen you've applied and it will do the math based on the weather and soil type and tell you, you have 30 pounds of nitrogen left here at Tassel, you're good to go, uh, or if you need to apply more, if, you, if you're running into a deficit. So, um, the soil data is the one that I get hung up on a lot. Um, I know they started, and some of them still use Sergo soil type data, and you know that data set, while good at the time it was created, is fairly um, old. I'm not going to say ancient, uh, but it's getting older. Um, and so ideally, you know, if we can use soil test with an organic matter layer on a half acre grid spacing, that's a really robust data set. Um, and if the algorithm uses organic matter, it can tell us more accurately where in the field we maybe need to apply nitrogen. Um, soil nitrate testing, you take a core 12 to 24 inches deep, um, but it's really hard to solve the spatial variability issue. Um, because how many samples do you want to take at that time of year, right before you side dress? And how do you know, you know, for me to that post in the back of the room, there's a lot of difference in soil types in some fields. And so we're gonna have different organic matter values and different nitrate levels based on soil characteristics. Um, but it's a snapshot in time, and you know, if you get your results back, this table um, kind of tells us what our soil test nitrate PPM is, the interpretation of that level, and then any nitrogen credits that we can get from the soil. So if you have over 26 parts per million soil test nitrates, that's a high test result, and you have all the nitrogen you need for the year. Um, if you're in this under 10 range, you need to be putting out your full nitrogen program because you're not getting any credit from the soil. Um, corn stalk nitrate test, this is kind of a forensic analysis. At this time of the year, when you're taking this test, it's too late to make any corrections. So it's telling us, did the program work? Um, so the drawback of that approach is, the program worked in 18, but as long as you have identical weather in 19, it, you know, you'll have the same result. So temporal um, instability is pretty big here on this test, I feel like. Um, but the way you do this test, you take an eight inch section of corn stalk starting six inches above the ground. So you're mailing um, a section of that plant from six inches to 14 inches. You cut that out, ship it off to the lab, um, and you get the results back. Uh, one place I think this could work, so if you're flat rate, if you're just straight rate nitrogen right now, 180 units per acre per year. Um, if you were to go out 
and sample in the high productive ground and then sample in the low productive ground up on those knolls, um, you know, that would maybe help guide you to variable rate nitrogen where if the knolls are deficient at the end of the year, maybe bump those up 10 or 20 pounds the following season um, and maybe the good ground, you know, leave it the same. Um, and the third one, or the fourth option is aerial imagery. Um, what imagery tells us is where the problems are in the field. It may not tell you exactly that this big red blob here is a nitrogen deficiency, um, but it can help point you in that direction. Um, and so late season nitrogen options, uh, we've got the dry rig here, um, and a lot of wide drops or nutrient bosses or drop tubes, pick your poison on Hagee's or Miller's out there. Um, last year, I guess there was a helicopter with a sling bucket spreader operating in the area. It's kind of different. Um, more common in forestry, uh, growing trees, they'll apply urea to forest. Um, and lastly, you know, you can put on urea with an airplane too. That works pretty good. So when does late season nitrogen pay? And it depends. It depends on the weather. So this table is our nitrogen uptake curve for corn throughout the season. And, you know, here's V10. We've, we've, brought, we've taken in about 25% of our nitrogen at this point. Um, and from V10 to VT, or R1, we're taking in another 50% of our nitrogen. So, you know, if you're side dressing, you're in here, V4, V5, V6, putting on nitrogen. Um, the big uptake is here, V10 to VT. Um, so if you get to R1 and you think, well, maybe I should apply more nitrogen, you really want to be sure because at that point, the plant's already taken up 75% of the nitrogen it needs for the year. And as we get into um, this next section on when it pays, this next, the next few slides, um, I'll kind of detail why maybe it doesn't pay all the time. Uh, but I got two examples, OSU E-Fields, and then we have a case study we did. Um, OSU E-Fields, how many are familiar with that publication? Okay, a fair number of you. Um, it's put out by Ohio State. John Fulton's here today. He helps manage that program. Um, and we have some, some of the results uh, booklets in the back table there. Um, and it's an amazing resource for farmers and agronomists. Um, when I read it each year, I learn something new, which is always good. Um, and here's their website. And here's what one of the results pages looks like in their booklet. Um, you've got all the study information on the left side of the page, or the book, um, study design with the different treatments, um, and then observations and results on the right half. Um, and this, I guess, back up. Uh, this is a nitrogen timing study. And I really like it because if we look at the treatments, we have at planting, 180 units, side dress application, 150, 180. The 180 matches the planting, so that's a good comparison. And then 210, and then the VT application has 150, 180, and 210. So the treatment rates match perfectly, so we can make good comparisons on, or we can be more confident in the results we're getting because they're direct comparisons of the treatments. And in this study, all nitrogen at V5 side dress out yielded late season application. And I believe that is because of the weather. Um, you know, 19 inches of rain for the year. That's not horrible. Uh, the most rain was in June, 5.72 inches. That's not too bad either compared to, oh, remember that number, 5.72. We're gonna talk about it in a minute. Um, but when, you summar, when I summarized all the OSUV fields data from 2018, um, most of the fields did not see a late season yield response to additional nitrogen. Um, and I expect that a lack of extreme precipitation plays a role in that. So talking about extreme precipitation, uh, this is a case study we had in Marysville this year. It's a 150-acre field, uh, total precipitation 21 and a half inches, uh, but the month of June, 
eight and three quarter inches of rain. And we had a four day window where we had four inches of rain, so an inch a day over those four days. And so we had a lot of concern about how much nitrogen was left. So our two options uh, were do nothing, it's too late in the year, let's go on vacation, um, or take a picture and see what we're dealing with. And so here's the picture I had up earlier. Um, it's an NDVI image of this field. Is this with a drone or a plane? Drone. Drone, okay. And what we did was we identified three areas in this field. Area one, kind of a mediocre yield potential. Area two, we call that low yield potential. Um, and area three, high yield potential because green is good on NDVI and that was a really green part of the field. Um, whenever you take a picture, it's good to get boots on the ground and actually figure out what's going on. So this big red area was a drowned out spot. So when you get an image like this, what you can do when you create the prescription is say, okay, don't apply to anything that's red. So we automatically know we have 18 acres in that field that are drowned out. Let's not apply nitrogen to them because we're not gonna see a response if there's no corn there. Um, and then also up here on the high yield potential, you now that stuff looks pretty good. Um, let's not apply any nitrogen there either. Um, when you generate these pres prescriptions, so you're putting nitrogen where it's needed um, and not where it's not gonna make a return. But we did run some check strips through that high yield area, so we'll talk about those later. So the plan of action, let's make a late season application. Uh, 25 gallons per acre, 28, with Y drops on July 9th. And here is the yield map. You know, we can see this drowned out area we talked about, still drowned out. No, no corn was harvested there. Um, but how, did, you know, did we have ROI, did it pay? So area one, our mid yielding uh, section of the field, yielded uh, 172, the check strip was 148, uh, so the difference of 24 bushels, and here are our price breakdowns. Corn at 350, nitrogen at 30 cents a unit, might be a little low. Um, y drop app, 15 bucks. Total expenses, 37.50. You know, in those mid-yield probability areas, we saw an ROI of almost $47. That low area, uh, not the drowned out area, but the area next to it that was low yield potential, you know, we saw a 38 bushel difference, so almost $100 return from that application. And the real interesting one is area three here, right here, the high yield potential area. You know, only six bushel return from that application. So we actually lost money by applying late season nitrogen to areas of the field that didn't need nitrogen, didn't need any help. Uh, so kind of my thoughts on this, you know, we need to continue to use tools to monitor nitrogen use throughout the season, uh, whether it's algorithms or actually doing nitrate testing. Aerial imagery is a great tool for guiding where we need to put nitrogen um, and then finally, there's some areas of the field that don't need any additional nitrogen. So why spend the money if you have a low probability of return? And that is all we have. We have it. We're going to scrap the starter fertilizer talk. Uh, we're out of time, and it was. Yes, so we're going to field some questions at this point. I think those will go up on Slido, or if you have questions, just raise your hand and we can address those. Let's, uh, let's hit some of these Slido questions and, and we'll take a few more if we need to. Do you have an accurate enough, app, do we have accurate enough application equipment to apply in, in the small of a grid? Um, yes, we get this question a lot. And the thing that you, you gotta realize is, is we're creating zones. So we're taking all these data points from the soil test standpoint, and then we create zones. And those zones create the areas that we either apply or we don't apply. So, and, and there's always a caveat to this answer, but in those zones we can do very well. 
The other part about that is, is we're using yield data. So we're collecting data every second with yield data and plugging that back in to create recommendations. And we get by just fine with that, it works well. Where we have the problem is, is when, and, and it's, it's when we get into like these small lime areas that I mentioned, where the areas, it's not that we can't apply them, typically at least, it's that it's just not worth applying. To take a custom rig, drive across an 80 acre field to apply a quarter of an acre or something like that. How important is it to sample, to sample at the same time every year? It's important. I, I don't know that I mentioned it, but I should have. Um, we want to do everything we can to keep everything as standard as possible. So yes, we should try and sample at the same time every time we sample. I will, there's a caveat to that too though, and that is, is we're having a hard time seeing, how, figuring out what that difference is if we don't do it. We just think that it's an easy one, it doesn't cost anything, why not just set up a nice strategy or plan to sample the same time every year? And on, on the sampling time of year, I like to tell guys, sample the opposite season that you spread fertilizer. If you spread fertilizer in the fall, sample in the spring, that way as soon as the combines roll, the spreader can be right behind it. You don't have a five to 15 day lag time from collecting samples. And that's not just us, that's um, other sample providers as well. What does sulfur do in the plant? Why does it boost yield? Um, I don't have a good technical answer to that other than sulfur and nitrogen are, are symbiotic. They They're play tied. together. Yep. And so as we're pushing nitrogen into the plant, we need that sulfur in that plant. And I, beyond that, I'm not, I don't have a good answer. So, What is the state of technology to eliminate the lab? That is, when will it be able to measure nutrients at depth in real time in the field? There's some work being done on this. We, uh, we actually did a little... Uh, project with uh, Dr. Fulton um, where there's a product called Soil Optrix where they're supposed to be able to do exactly what we're talking about, measuring nutrients in the field as it goes across. Um, and we, we haven't got a chance to tear into those results yet. I think we're still, and maybe I'll change my mind once I see the data, but I think we're a ways off from that yet. But there's some work being done out there. I think the lab is always going to be a part of it because we always have to be a part of that calibration process to get us back to, to a known value. I think it's kind of like the smart firmer is another one that it measures the organic matter. It doesn't really measure the organic matter. It's, it's measuring, I believe, soil color. We still always have to go back to knowing what that known organic matter value is. But if it's a, a denser data set and we can somehow leverage it, we're, we're always going to be looking for those opportunities. Can thiosol serve as a nitrogen stabilizer for surface applied UAN? No, it can't. Uh, UAN is still, um, it's still the, the urea side of it is volatile. It doesn't act as a stabilizer. How accurate are nitrogen sensing systems? Uh, we've done a little bit of work with Optrix. Um, there's the Green Seeker. I assume that's what you're talking about. Um, it's, it, it can do its job but it's, uh, it's not an a easy, it's not an on and off switch. You basically have to have an agronomist in the, in the system, in the rig, to, to help it understand what it's supposed to do. A lot of things go into it. A good example is sulfur. Well, it's kind of reading the greenness of the, the, the leaf. Well, if you've got other things that are causing that leaf not to green, like sulfur, it's gonna pick that up and say, put on more nitrogen. So that's kind of back to why you need that agronomist in the system to, to be able to say, whoa, no, this isn't a nitrogen issue, this is a sulfur issue, therefore let's not use the green seeker in this field. Um, or optics. And with those sensors too, so if you do a split planter, you know, planting hybrid A on the left side, hybrid B on the right side, <laughs> hybrid A is gonna be a different color than hybrid B. So, you know, if hybrid A is lighter, it's gonna be putting on more nitrogen even to hybrid B as well. So that's something to consider. And the green seeker and optric systems are time of year sensitive too. So if you go out there at V5 and think it's gonna do a good job varying your nitrogen rate, um, it's just not going to because there's too much soil available for the sensor. Your corn hasn't canopied yet, so it's picking up the brown from the soil and that's gonna affect the application rate. It's really, uh, V9, V10 sort of application tool. 
I think it's kind of a segue too, but I, this this um, deep learning, artificial intelligence, the ability for these systems to learn and know these nutrient deficiencies is going to be huge in how we can, I think, to the future of building variable rate nitrogen programs, late season nitrogen programs. Um, I look at it as it's got the potential to be like taking a plant sample every eight and being able to, to turn that into, I know this is potassium, I know this is phosphorus, I know this is boron, and then we can spatially map it. There's, there, I mean, hang on to your hats. It's going to be really cool on this front as we go forward. Uh, one question from the crowd. If we have any, then we better move on. Then we're going to move on. Next up, we have uh, Alex, and I've forgotten your last name. Alex Whitley um, from uh, Tyrannus. And uh, we're real excited to be partnered with them on this whole um, artificial intelligence piece and how it fits into what we do as far as boots on the ground agronomy. It, uh, to me, this is the game changer that we're all going to be working around with and through in the next 20 years. So with that, Alex, I'm going to pass it off to you and let you explain it all. So my name is Alex Whitley. I am in, in charge of global marketing for Tyrannus. Just a little background on myself. I've been in ag imagery for um, 10 and a half years or so, about 10 years. And um, I've been in several of these presentations, just like you all. Uh, imagery uh, has gotten a little stale, I think. Uh, how, how, how many of you have tried imagery in the past? Yep. Has it stuck with you? Has it become part of your program? Or have you as a farmer seen it as an additional process that has lots of interpretation? So we have to start somewhere um, in any industry. And I think what you're about to see is the first time that uh, we, we are to the point where imagery is really working for us. It's not an additional uh, step. It's not an additional process. Uh, there's not much room for interpretation here. What you're about to see and what we provide, what uh, Integrated Ag will provide, uh, is insights uh, to your fields that you, you haven't seen before. So, perfect. So we talked about traditional scouting. A lot of what we were talking about earlier today has to do with ground truthing. And even when we were talking about imager, images in um, relation to uh, prescription building, uh, the NDVI images are incredible for that, but you still have to know what is red, what is green, and what is yellow, right? And if you're managing a lot of fields and you big farm, it's really hard to get out there uh, and, and, and check at high density levels. So we ran, this is a couple years ago, we ran this test, and what you're seeing up there in the top left was how many points we were able to do uh, with traditional scouting. And this was myself and, and two other folks. And to go out, even with, with a guided iPhone app, take images and say, you know, this is mare's tail, this is a sulfur deficiency in corn, this is X, Y, and Z, and capture that, um, we were able to get 99 points, and it took us uh, 55 hours. So we um, employed our technology after that. And I, I didn't think it was going to be this wide. I thought I'd done a really good job. Um, but uh, according to this, I did a really poor job. Uh, we got to, on the same area, we got 2,349 points, and it took an hour and 40 minutes. So let me tell you how this works. Uh, in DBI imagery, what we're looking at uh, is, again, critical for building recommendations. That is whole field imagery. It's a green and red image of your entire field. Um, Forget about that for now. What we're doing is, we were talking a lot earlier today about sampling, right? So what we're talking about today is image sampling. Now, we get to the, before we get into that, we get into the same problem uh, as we have with uh, other, you know, traditional ways of using imagery. If you have 100 fields, right, and you have, or say you have 20 fields. Um, if you have 20 fields and you have 
historical imagery for all of those fields. Maybe it's a, around 120 images per field. Uh, you wind up with too many images. You can't do anything with them, right? Have you, have you ever had a little bit of data overload? I'm sure you have that all the time. And it's, it's impossible to manage, and that's why adoption on these things is really slow. Well, what we're doing here is we are doing image sampling. So each image is like 10 by 10 uh, feet. And we're averaging about, it's between uh, one image every three quarters of an acre to one image every acre. So we can just think of it as one image every acre. Now I've done a ton of scouting uh, in my time all over the place and I have never been able to scout, scout at a density level uh, that high. The other thing is, oh, we'll just go back to this. If we have, uh, then you have a, you have a, so you have a field that's 100 acres. So you have 100 images. That's still way too many to go through, right? Even if we have this cool imagery that you are about to see, right? Here, I'll jump ahead real quick. Imagery like this, and we'll, we'll go into a little bit in depth. Even if you have very cool images like this, it's still data overload. You can't do anything with them. So what if you see a bug on a leaf? And so what if you see a little nitrogen uh, deficiency? We need to know where those images are taken, and we need to be able to search them, and we need to be able to view them geographically. And that's exactly what we're doing. And they're also, uh, we need them to be referenceable. So as I go back, this is what your traditional uh, NDVI would look like that you would uh, use for prescriptions. Uh, on the left is NDVI, on the right is um, RGB, both of which we uh, deliver. And this is just a good example of um, a healthy portion of this particular field. Again, on the left, you see a lot of green. That means that uh, the biomass is healthy, chlorophyll is there. And on the right, that's uh, RGB is visible. Think of you just sticking your head out the, an airplane window and, and looking down. Uh, that's what we see. And we see a lot of straight green rows, even though it's very early. This is like V3 corn. So then, this would be an example of what um, poor NDVI looks like or uh, poor field. And on the, on the right there, uh, you can see a lot of brown or washed out. That's bare dirt. That means this is, again, early season. We have a really low emergence. That's what we're looking at right here. But again, we still want to understand what's going on and leverage um, this machine learning, which is what we're using here. We're teaching a computer algorithm uh, with an enormous amount of agronomic um, insights to produce these uh, uh, summaries for us. So over here, if you look, this, these are just screenshots from what you would receive. None of this is doctored up or anything. This is what we're delivering. So not only is it an image, but there's analytics applied to it. So what we're looking at here, I didn't know if I had a little point. Oh, there we go. So what we're looking at here is uh, early season emergence. And we're actually quantifying every single plant per image. So again, you get a 100 acre field with one sample per 100 acres, and we'll tell you what your emergence count is and your stand count. On top of that, we'll be uh, quantifying some other things. So we can tell the different altitudes of emergence. We can tell if the plant has fallen over, and we can provide you some insights to that too. So instead of adding uh, you know, additional processes, what we're looking at now is uh, we're replacing you having to go out to the field every single day. Maybe you want to cover all your fields at specific growth stages and find out what's going on. Well, we can turn that around for low cost really, really quickly, and you'll have higher sample densities than you've ever had before. Have any of you s scouted a uh, 100 points or each acre in a 100 acre field at volume, maybe over your whole farm? No. And that's why we have technology like this. So here's, here's another example. We will actually uh, provide stand counts and emergence reports up until we can't see the world anymore. And that's what you're looking at here. So beyond that, instead of you getting lost in looking at a 
ton of different images. We have nice summaries as well. So what we're looking at here, again, is we're taking all of these image samples per field and then providing you with a nice clean report so you can make sense of it. So we produce heat maps based on emergence. And what we have here is a legend. It might be hard to read, uh, but it's uh, 28,000, I think, uh, population. This is for corn. 28,000 population is the red, up to like 32,000 was yellow, and green was uh, over 32,000. So it gives you a quick visual, visual representation of not only one individual field, but your entire farm, your whole operation. And that's important, uh, and that's not been done before. So what we want to do is I want to get away from looking at field to field to field because it takes too long. I want to look at my data over an entire farm. And I want it visual. I want to have very little input because I just want to derive uh, decisions really quickly and uh, easily. And that's what we're trying to do here. So then we provide uh, an actual report. Uh, very simple again. has your field name and then the field average. So we're adding up all those individual image samples and interpolating the average for the field. Now you may want a higher sample density, uh, or maybe you hear folks talking about wanting to quantify every single plant in, in, in the whole field. The technology is there, we've been doing it for years, but it just costs a lot of money to process all of that data. So we just have to wait until uh, server space and things like that uh, get uh, less expensive and then we can offer that. Uh, so it's too expensive to offer as a service, but just know it's coming. But this is certainly better than me going out in your field and checking three spots and telling you that that's the population for the whole field. Right, so we, my personal philosophy is we need to get away from this, this kind of theoretical thinking and, and get down to what works in the field. And if I'm checking three spots uh, in a field for a normal stand count, uh, this is, you know, 97 times sampled more than that. And that's a significant improvement. It's not perfect because we're not counting every single plant, but it's one heck of an improvement to what I can do today. So, some other things that we're quantifying um, with our artificial intelligence here are weeds, disease, and insects. You might ask how we're doing that, or what is machine learning? Machine learning is just um, teaching a uh, computer algorithm uh, to recognize specific uh, signatures within whatever you're looking at. In our case, we're looking at photographs. So uh, I've worked with machine learning for a long time and you hear that term a lot. And it gets thrown around pretty loosely. Uh, most folks just think that these computers are gonna teach themselves, but it's called machine learning. Uh, we have to teach them. But instead of relying on one, uh, one set of inputs, kind of an artificial input, what we're doing is coming at it from several ways. So we do have a mobile app of which you go out and you, you tag different items in, in your scouting activities. This is mare's tail. Uh, this is milk thistle. And you're, this is lamb's quarter. And you're, you're, you're taking pictures of it. So we have a team of agronomists that are actually going through that and saying, yep, that's mare's tail, check. And then that gets categorized and, and the algorithm says, okay, that's what mare's tail looks like. I need 1,500 more examples to be able to, put, to, to quantify it and classify it. Um, so what we do on top of your input is we have 400 taggers. So we are throwing people at this and that's why we're able to innovate so quickly. I don't know why other uh, Industries aren't, aren't doing this too much, but we need people to, to accelerate this. So we've got 400 folks. They're split into several teams, all managed by PhD agronomists. Um, and not only are they scouring our images and tagging them uh, manually, uh, we also, uh, when, when they're out of season, like right now, uh, most of the taggers are out of season, uh, they're going through uh, agronomic journals, and pulling images uh, from different growth stages of these weeds and diseases and uh, insects and uh, just feeding the uh, machine learning algorithm. And you'll see it throughout here. Sometimes it'll, you'll, you'll see in these images, it'll just say weed, right? 
So we will, we will always quantify. We know what a weed looks like. We know what a bug looks like, or insect is, as we call it. We know what chemical injury looks like. We know what leaf damage looks like. Sometimes um, we don't have something tagged enough to say frog eye leaf spot, which you'll see uh, now. So the cool thing about being here in the Midwest, I'm from Indiana, um, is that corn and beans are almost 100% automated now because we do such a large volume of it. The, when I'm saying that we're feeding the algorithm all these uh, uh, new pests and threats and things like that, that's in specialty crops. So I just got back from doing a lot of work in California um, and in the Imperial Valley, and they're doing just every crop you could possibly imagine. Um, we know what's in corn and beans. Uh, I, I'm learning, but uh, before last week, I had no clue what's in strawberries and blueberries and melons and things like that. So that's what we're still using our human power to start uh, classifying that. Any, any questions about uh, machine learning and, and our technology? before we jump into what we're, what we're actually delivering. No? So, as you can see here, this uh, is quantified as weeds. We're also seeing leaf damage here and here. Here, is, um, here are some other examples. Uh, what you're looking at here, actually, I pulled these from um, Indiana and Ohio. So this is very relevant to your geographies. What we're looking at here is soybeans. We've got some uh, broadleaf weed here. Uh, we've got uh, some quantified, uh, or some classified, but all of them are quantified. And we have uh, defoliation as well. Here, this is pretty cool. This, was, uh, this happened about three quarters of the way through last season. We are recognizing volunteer corn as a weed. A lot of times that would just be uh, looked at as a crop and often missed. This way we can quantify it throughout your whole field and you can understand how much and, and what product you need uh, for a burn down if, if you do. There's it again in uh, soybeans. So these are um, image, image examples of what we are delivering on. One thing I'd like to add uh, as, you, uh, as we go through this is this is not experimental technology. We're not a startup company from San Francisco. Uh, we've been doing this for five and a half years, uh, delivering imagery. We are the biggest at what we do. And what you're looking at uh, right here, this new product, if you, if you will, is ground, uh, virtual ground truthing. We delivered on a million acres last year in uh, North America alone, most of which was uh, here in the Midwest. So we are doing this um, at scale, and um, it works. So here's, we're looking at uh, some flooded corn. And this is just a testament to uh, how well our machine learning works. This is totally submerged corn. This was in Illinois um, this past season. And we are still able to quantify weeds, and they're totally submerged. Okay. So this is what it looks like, again, uh, when you're looking at your whole farm. So right here we have a whole farm. These are all individual um, areas. And if you look over here, I'm, I don't want to get too much into the platform itself, uh, but if you can type in a box and make two clicks, you can get anywhere you want in here. And that's a big part of uh, my job at Tyrannus to make sure that the user experience is uh, really easy. Um, again, I come from the farm gate, so what I want is something really easy. I don't want to be inputting a bunch of data all the time. I want to <laughs> click a couple of buttons and understand what's going on in my, not just one field, but all of them. So here we're looking at an entire territory. The little purple dots, as you zoom in, um, are all the individual um, image samples. Now what's very cool about this is in this search bar, right here you see weeds um, has, has a filter. So you can filter for anything that's popped up. If you want to go all the way down to mare's tail, say I want to know where my mare's tail is. Remember, we're dealing with like 2,200 pictures 
Um, and actually, in this example, there'd be a lot more than that. There's probably 5,000 images, which would be unusable if it wasn't searchable. So you just type in mare's tail, and all the purple dots will disappear that don't have mare's tail. And only, only the uh, image samples that contain mare's tail will show up. So you're immediately dialing down to, where, uh, to what you're interested in. Nitrogen deficiency, you'll see, but uh, we quantify that too. If you want to, if you're interested in nitrogen deficiency, where am I nitrogen deficient? Type that in the box and all the images will disappear that do not contain nitrogen deficiencies. And for each one of these things, remember that heat map that we were looking at with emergence? Just three colors, red, green, and yellow, it was based on the population and sample sizes. You're gonna be able to do that with weeds uh, and disease as well. So you'll be able to quickly produce kind of a heat map of your high, medium, and low across every single field in your farm, whether it's nitrogen deficient, sulfur deficient, uh, whatever you apply the filter for. So here, this is a, a better example. So these are quite a few fields, maybe 15 fields or so in here. You see all these dots? Those are our sample areas. So again, when I'm, uh, if, if I went to scout those 15 or so fields at a sample density of, of that high, it, I mean, it would take me a week at least. I don't know if I could get it done. And then what would I do uh, with my observations? Would you be able to go back and look at them again? Would you be able to reference them really quickly? With this, we can. We just select an image date. When did that image occur? Oh, J July 15th. And you want to look at that last year? July 15th, filter for weeds, filter for nitrogen defin deficiency, and compare year to year. It's multi-year analysis in two clicks, right? right? Right at your fingertips. So what we have here, these lists are not arbitrary. Um, this one, I can't read that, but that those are the image dates I have selected there um, for this particular territory. And these are all the individual weeds that were tagged. So again, I'll, I'll use mare's tail example. If mare's tail does not appear in any of these images, it's not gonna appear in the list. These are not arbitrary lists that are only populating based on um, what we've classified. And you'll also see the number of incidents. So like velvet leaf, we have one out of 16,000 931. So a velvet leaf is probably not a big deal, but we found one instance of it, and you can filter right there. So that answers our question, how many image samples are in this farm right here? In this one imaging event, it's uh, over, uh, it's about 17,000. And again, in one click, you can narrow down to what you want to look at. That's some good looking corn in it, wow. So we're quantifying disease as well. This, is, uh, this was uh, yellowing is what we're calling it now. Um, after we're seeing more and more signatures of this, we're gonna start um, quantifying it as rust and, and things like that. We're, we're already starting to um, after a couple of these fields rolled in. Here um, we have some uh, northern leaf blight. We have some defoliation occurring, and you can see this corn has just started to tassel. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of, uh, throughout the growth stages, what the images uh, are gonna look like. And here's gray leaf spot um, on uh, corn. And again, you can, read, you can read here the other uh, items that were, uh, other threats that we're finding in these images. And there's the uh, soybeans there. So again, you can filter for insects, diseases, insects, uh, emergence, different uh, elevations of emergence, or altitudes of emergence. And what we're doing here is we filter for insects. And this was interesting, this is just in uh, central Indiana, uh, near where I grew up on the west side of Indianapolis. And we were scouting this whole territory using this, 
And um, in about 15 seconds, we determined, we went through 2,200, there's 2,200 images. In about 15 seconds, we found out that we did not have a weed problem. We didn't have any sort of a deficiency problem, but we had an insect problem. We knew where the source field was, and we knew the perimeter of which um, these insects were affecting it. And we uh, knew, so in our heads, we knew what to spray, kind of how much. So when we went out to the field, it wasn't, hey, let's spend a week scouting these 15 fields and find out what's going on. We already knew what was out there. And we, uh, uh, when we went out to the field, we were already spraying. So this is a uh, kind of a zoomed out example of what we saw in red. Uh, insects will always light up in, in red. And as you hover over, they'll kind of blink at you. I have to use that all the time because the insects are so small, it's, it's hard to see. You can always zoom in on these images, which I think is what we're looking at. Yep. So this is zoomed in from those images. So now we know exactly what's going on. It's a Japanese beetle problem. These were just several images I smashed together. So we do know it's a Japanese beetle problem. And in this particular area, Japanese beetles aren't that uh, big of a problem. I know a little bit further up north, uh, they're a really big problem and we do proactive spraying for them. But th this, was a, this was a pretty big win. Whoops. Thank you. And here's, we got uh, a worm and soybeans here, and that's what we're looking at. I want to make sure we don't forget anything. And then uh, I want to follow up with when to fly, why do you fly, and uh, what type of imagery do you use? So you know we do have satellite imagery. Um, the industry also has uh, whole field imagery that we were looking at earlier. Plus we have this new uh, incredible leaf level uh, image sets with analytics tied to it, which are gonna be our, our ground truthing. Um, this is the question that, that is always asked. So just to let you guys know, uh, based on my experience throughout uh, the Midwest, I put together these packages. At least give you a guideline of, of why we're flying and when we're flying and to just uh, go over as an example. Um, emergence, we went through emergence and what that looks like. So in emergence, remember we can uh, quantify uh, what is out there. So if you plant it at a 34,000 population and your information comes back at a uh, 22,000 population, then you can start asking yourself, is there something going on with my planner? Uh, is there something going on with the hybrid not coming out? Is there something wrong with like hydraulic downforce that we see all the time, hydraulic downforce tubes? Um, and then it can help you determine replant. So you would need, uh, you can use satellite imagery just to kind of get you in the ballpark, that's what we're seeing here. And then of course, uh, that leaf level imagery for your uh, stand and emergence calculations. V3 to V6. That's we're looking at nutrient deficiencies and weeds, side dressing, tissue sampling, um, agronomic validation, and uh, drainage issues. And that's when we're recommending all three. Because at that point, anytime we're looking for nutrient problems or we're looking at uh, vigor, like plant vigor, we want that whole field imagery. Because in the event that we're gonna need to side dress, or top dress uh, with sulfur or uh, Nitrogen, we're seeing a lot of boron in um, uh, soybeans, uh, uh, like in, in the northern Iowa and in Minnesota area. We're going to want that whole field image to convert into uh, prescription. And we're also going to want that leaf level imagery so we can see what's actually out there. I want to know what the red is, I want to know what the yellow is, and I, I want to know what the green is. And then V7 and V10, again, tissue sampling, micronutrients, Y drops, uh, V11 to R1. That's when we start getting into fungicide. Now, fungicide is a really good correlation to NDVI values. We're talking about NDVI values in, in the last 
uh, presentation. And that, that's a great time to use NDVI imagery to uh, apply. And then, of course, uh, monitoring dry down. Have any of you used NDVI imagery at the end of the season uh, for harvest prioritization or yield prediction? It may be something you want to try this year. We're having a ton of success the past several years in here in Ohio. Um, particularly, there's a group that does it in the Cyrus area. And um, I'll just kind of share what they're doing. They've got quite a few uh, farmers that don't have uh, yield monitors. That is a reality. It's funny that we talk all the time about all this high-tech stuff, and we think everybody understands it, and it's very easy. Well, the truth is it's really hard um, in, until now when we have some, some heavy analytics doing a lot of the work. And you got guys like Integrated Ag that are providing those agronomic services. Um, so you don't you don't have to do all of that heavy lifting um, on your own. But what they were doing was there was such a huge barrier of entry for precision ag in general for a farmer. Uh, we were running into guys that said, "Gosh, I don't have anything. Where do I start? I'm a yield monitor. I don't I don't have my uh, field boundary. I know these fields. I go out there and plant. I do pretty darn well. And this seems like a whole big uh, headache or it's intimidating to get into." So what they started doing was making dummy yield maps. So they would fly in DVI at the end of the season, create some zones, do a traditional grain count, you know, up and down around the ear, and then uh, say, okay, this zone has this pop, or this zone has uh, you know, uh, 200,000 bush or 200 bushel. This zone has 170. This zone has 225. And so you get an average for each of those zones, and then you get an average across your whole field. It is really, really simple. And uh, our accuracy we're seeing over the past uh, four years is like within uh, five bushels. So that's pretty darn accurate. And you're also getting that information, you know, without running your monitor. And uh, you're getting that information to go to market early because you're getting your yield map, uh, you know, about two months before you normally would, which will help in market, uh, making marketing decisions. So I just want you to keep that in mind that you don't need a whole lot of information to get a whole lot of useful uh, insight. And that's what we're, we're here to do. Any questions about what you've seen so far? Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, satellites, are you giving that information on yield through the satellites? Um, no. I, we, we've tried that. Um, we do provide some really interesting uh, satellite analytics for your whole farm. And you can talk to uh, Integrated about providing that. Uh, it's a real easy way to see how your field is trending compared to its crop-specific self over the past five years. I use that every single day during the season. Um, and again, you add, ask the uh, Integrated guys and they'll, they'll go over that with you. The problem with satellite imagery and NDVI values, it's not granular enough that I'd want to hedge my, my uh, yield prediction on it. So when we're, when we're flying um, whole field imagery with airplanes, our, uh, I try to stay out of this, but like our pixel size is eight centimeters. So we're actually pulling a one and a zero, you know, these values, on each individual plant. It's deadly accurate. To whereas um, even the best satellite imagery out there, you're kind of treating, uh, yeah, maybe like a 10 by 10 um, area as a pixel. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, somewhat, but when you had the, uh, the red with uh, this and the green and the blue and everything, now is that done with a drone? Yeah, so let's go back here. And I'll explain a little bit of how we capture this. Okay, so the leaf level imagery and analytics that you were seeing, we capture with a drone. And this drone is uh, it's called uh, Matrice 600, so it's, it's a real big, big drone. 
and we uh, came up with our own imagery systems. Uh, again, uh, it's full production. We delivered on a million acres last year. So within this imagery system, we have a Canon 5D Mark IV, if any of you are photographers out there. It's a really nice high-end DSLR. We have a 400 millimeter uh, Canon L glass lens, which is really, really nice optical uh, lens there. And what we're doing is our, our secret sauce lies in our uh, military grade lasers. So they, we use them for guidance and we also use them for stabilization. So how we're able to capture images that sharp th that you were looking at. Let's go here. Yep, we can freeze there. So these images, the drone doesn't stop when it takes these images. So even look at some, uh, like a real busy sort of image with high, higher bionics, something like that. Um, something like that right there. I mean, those are really crisp, clear images, and we're taking those at like 32 miles an hour. So traditionally, when you're taking imagery with a, a drone, you'll fly over, stop, take an image, fly over, stop, take an image. The problem with that is battery life. And that's why it takes so long to survey, and it doesn't really make sense um, for your time and, and money because you have to pay basically a pilot per hour. Um, and it's going to take them a long time to capture the imagery. And in ag, time is everything. If we can't turn this around quick enough, then it, it doesn't mean anything, right? It has to be turned around quick enough for you to make. Speaking of, of that, like replant, if you find out you have to replant, how fast are you replanting? really fast, 24 hours sometimes, 40 hours, depending on inventory. So we've got to be able to turn this stuff around really quickly for you to make those critical decisions. In-season nitrogen applications, got to be able to do that really quickly. And it's really hard to do that across a whole farm. Maybe you can do it on one field, maybe. Uh, but to do it across a whole farm really quickly, that's when you're going to need a large infrastructure of pilots with a process and these military-grade lasers and, uh, that, are, that are doing all this heavy lifting. So we're able to fly 32, 34 miles an hour, and never stop and capture capture this imagery. So from there, we have a data upload, and then we have a big um, pipeline team that processes all this imagery uh, right in New Richmond, Wisconsin. So what elevation are you at that taking those pictures right here? Uh, we're, about, we're, we're still kind of experimenting based on sample size. Our sample sizes are gonna be a little bit larger for stand count because the bigger your sample size, the, 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 the more accurate it is. Um, but we're flying at like 300 feet, 250 feet. So when, now when we're doing, like right now, we're finishing up season in Brazil and Argentina, and I'm just down there getting them all set up. Um, they're allowed to fly this with airplanes, but we're not allowed, allowed here. Plus, especially like in the Ohio River Valley, there's way too, much elevation change uh, for an airplane to handle that. We've got some questions coming through Slido oh, right. up here, so uh, let's deal with a couple of these. With the Tyrannus scouting, are the sample images random or targeted? Um, the sample images are targeted. There is talk about allowing, if you're flying our whole field imagery, to um, allow you all to create your flight path. So this is going to be this. This would be for uh, the year after, not this season. But what that would allow you to do is, if you flew a whole field image, and you say, "Well, I know that's that's here's red, green, and yellow. But I know that red is drowned out area. I don't really want images of that. I'm going to concentrate my hundred images. If hundred acre field, I'm going to concentrate my hundred images in." this particular area, which would increase your sample size in the areas that you're interested in. So there is talk about doing that. Right now we're pretty much doing a one acre grid across a field with a couple outliers on purpose. Um, we are flying edge of field. You always have one or two images that are edge of field. A lot of problems that like insects, especially that are coming, um, that occur in the field, occur or, or begin on that edge of the field. 
Okay, percentage-wise, how many times will a Tyrannus scouting change your application recommendation as compared with the traditional ground scouting methods? Can I chime in on this one? Before? Yeah, please. While you churn away at that. So the way I envision this is, is let's take disease. So here we are at corn is, is right at tassel. And we've got about a 10 day window to make that decision whether we apply fungicides or not. In the past, we've dashed like mad, mad men into the field, took a quick look, pulled back out. And atypically what we'll do is we'll overcompensate. We'll go in, you'll do the same thing as a farmer. You go in and eh, it looks like we got some disease. Let's get the plane rolling, let's fly. And what are we gonna fly? Well, we may get real smart and we may fly a couple varieties because we know they are more susceptible. Or we may just fly everything because we know we only got one shot at this thing. So this is where this comes in, is now we've got one sample per acre. So you farm a thousand acres of corn, you got a thousand data points, and we can start to process those data points so we can identify those fields that have high pressure, those fields because we know the variety, those fields with those varieties with high pressure. So it's about real, actionable data at near real time that allows us to make better decisions. Completely different than the way we do it now. I don't know if you want to throw anything else on that or not. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> Can you predict yield? If so, how soon before harvest? So generally, um, <clears throat> just past tassel, the, the, the way we can predict yield is not by using the leaf level imagery, as we were speaking about. Um, the way we do that is with whole field NEVI imagery at a high resolution. And that's usually just past tassel. Um, then we, we use that image, bust that up into however many grids that you want. You can go all the way up to like, or not grids, excuse me, zones. You can go all the way up to uh, 50 in our, in our system, which would be a lot. Um, but if you wanted to sample that many, you could do that. It's traditional um, ear counts. You plug that information in per zone. We give you an average per zone, and then of course the field average. And uh, again, that's about that is as accurate in this specific area. Remember, it was Osiris. Um, it's been doing it for several years, and its accuracy is uh, within about five bushels. Can you find tile lines? We can definitely find tile lines. That is a, a big piece of what we do. So uh, in regards to water, uh, now that it's on my mind, irrigation, if you have uh, any irrigated fields, I know it's kind of hit or miss around here. Um, Southeast Indiana for some reason has just started irrigating everything. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure why, but um, we find plug nozzles all the time uh, in irrigators. And I know that a lot of precision ag tools and, 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 and other image providers, they're always looking for these, um, uh, these, these how to save on your nitrogen cost and, and nickel and diming these things. But a plug nozzle uh, can cost you a whole lot more money than, than what you think. So we, we keep our eyes open to, to everything and there are big ROIs on that sort of stuff. So how would Tyrannus differentiate between mites, SCN, and rust in soybeans? So it means cyst nematodes, is the SCM. Yep, so we can see, rust. this is something we're working on right now, we can see rust, mites is uh, still really difficult. Um, sometimes we can see them, sometimes we can't, and uh, sometimes they look similar. So, uh, which is what your question is, is at, uh, asking. So. Right now, there's no way that we are differentiating between them, but we are working on that uh, specifically. Uh, another question kind of surrounding that um, is uh, egg pods or larvae that are on the bottom of leaves. If you were thinking that, um, we sometimes see that and we sometimes don't. Um, we're looking at certain shadows they cast from the bottom up but those images have to be taken at a certain time of day. In a controlled environment, we can identify them. In a non-controlled environment, we can't. And my brain's always thinking about commercialization and production. So I would tell you personally, no, we can't do that. But just know we have done it 
um, in a controlled environment, and we are looking on how to make that uh, accurate enough that we would feel comfortable making it commercially available in the product. Do you sell the drones and software or offer only the service? We offer the service. There are uh, strategic partners in really specific areas that we lease our equipment to, but it comes with a pretty serious um, onboarding training. For instance, uh, I, was, I was doing that in um, all through South America a couple of months ago, and then I'm heading, after this, I'm heading to uh, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, Costa Rica, uh, and Mexico to get our, some partners there fired up on it. So we are looking, uh, we're always looking for more uh, providers. So if you are a commercial pilot uh, and you have your drone license and you also know a little bit about photography, uh, we're always open to, to speaking with you to, to become uh, a provider, uh, like an actual image collector. How do you facilitate management decisions? How do you boil it down to action level priorities or intervention? That's a great question and that's uh, exactly what we're trying to do. Before we had this leaf level imagery, we knew we were looking at the whole field. We knew some areas in the fields were healthy. We knew some of the areas were doing okay. And we knew some of the areas were really poor. High definition NDVI is really good if you know how to read it. Um, but it always needs ground truth. Almost every time it needs ground truth. So when you're integrated ag and they're taking care of all of you, can you imagine how difficult that would be to look at every single one of all of your fields and be able to come to a management decision in 48 hours? That's really tough. So that's exactly where what you saw today, this analytics and machine learning come into play. What we're trying to do is take that time that it takes them to look at every single one of all of your fields and we can smash that down so they can do it really, really quickly and make those decisions. I think a lot of decisions uh, being made around the whole country for that reason, um, and I used to make the same ones, is you run out of time. You don't have time to look at the data and you just say, uh, yeah, well, we better put it out there because you know we don't want to be short. And this is the first time where we really can get an extremely high density of ground truth, real, non-interpreted, actual data quickly to make those management decisions. Are your image-based yield predictions different on timing and accuracy between corn and soybeans? So we do it on, we are not doing it on soybeans. Uh, I have some people that swear by it. Oh, whoops. Oh, there. I have some people that swear by it. I have not seen enough consistency across the board. If something works in just a little area, that's not, that's not enough. Um, so I have seen it work in individual areas of soybeans. Um, I have not seen it work across a large area enough to where I'd be comfortable recommending you do that. Corn, uh, seed corn, corn, popcorn, and um, silage, we've seen it work really well in, in those crops. Thank right. you. Thank you, Alex. We've got a couple of quick things here before lunch. Um, first announcement.